Um, I think we're going to go ahead and get going with our lunchtime discussion. I hope you've all enjoyed your lunch. Uh, um, unfortunately, our speakers, we dragged them away from their desserts um, to uh, present their presentations on an incredibly important topic on the whole issue around the Afghan National Security Forces and their development um, and the issues associated for that. And that warrants a, a minimum of a two-day conference in its own right, and we've, we're only limiting that discussion to this lunch. Uh, now, obviously, already in our morning discussions and in future discussions, the whole, some of the tensions between the uh, objectives around on the military side and counterterrorism, counterinsurgency, you know, obviously conflicted with some of the state building, state strengthening uh, uh, initiatives that's already come up and will continue to come up. But I think today, right now, over lunch, I thought we'd give an opportunity to two extremely qualified people to comment on some of their vo thoughts around the whole issue of building the Afghan National Security Forces. Uh, obviously, it's an area also that consumed a vast amount of resources, a very high percentage of the resources spent in Afghanistan uh, during the last 13, 14 years. Um, we're going to start off with Ambassador Carl Eikenberry. Um, few other American officials have been as involved in Afghanistan over the period we're discussing in this conference than Ambassador Eikenberry. Uh, first in 2002 and 2003 as the U.S. Security Coordinator, then back in 2005 to 2007 as commander of U.S.-led coalition forces, and then once again back in 2009, 2010 as the U.S. Ambassador to Kabul where he oversaw or maybe not oversaw, but was uh, witnessed um, the 2009-2010 elections um, and, and what went, went along with that. Uh, Ambassador Eikenberry is now the William J. Perry Fellow in International Security at the Center for International Security and Cooperation uh, at Stanford University. Um, and with both of our speakers, I could go on and take all of our time introducing them, but their bios are there, so I won't go in more detail. But I did want to acknowledge uh, Carl's role and instrumental role behind this conference. I think it was nearly a year ago that he first raised uh, the idea of ho organizing a conference here at USIP, uh, trying to look back at the lessons of the last 13, 14 years to try to inform future efforts, not only in Afghanistan, but in other contexts. So this conference is his idea to begin with. So let me go ahead and also in introduce uh, Ambassador uh, Minister Jalali, uh, who will then speak uh, right after um, Carl. Um, we are very fortunate to have Dr. Minister Jalali as a senior expert here at USIP. Um, before joining, um, from 2003 to 2005, Minister Jalali was the Minister of Interior in Afghanistan. Um, he has also served as a distinguished professor at the Near East South Asia Center for Strategic Studies and as a researcher at the Institute for National Strategic Studies at National Defense University in D.C. since 2005. Um, he has a long and distinguished career also as a journalist. He was the Regional Director for Voice of America, also spent time in Peshawar working for Voice of America during the 1990s. Um, I should also note he's about to come out with the two-volume definitive military history of Afghanistan from ancient empires to modern wars, which is going to be published soon by Prager. So we'll have to have you all back for another launch of that volume when it comes out. But now I'll turn it over to you, Carl. Thank you very much. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. And I'm delighted to be sharing the uh, stage here with my old friend, Dr. Uh, Jalali, Minister uh, Jalali. I think that some of what we're going to be talking on the stage here are things that uh, we talked about over tea in 2005 in the Minister of Interior's office. Uh, the purpose of this uh, conference, as you know, was to try to take an objective look at uh, state building efforts over the last 13 years in Afghanistan, both with an eye on informing uh, the international community in the United States continued support of Afghanistan in the years ahead, which I'm confident will remain sizable. And secondly, to inform both international community and United States efforts of dealing with uh, what we can call wars of uh, internal disorder in the future. I think it's safe to conclude that the United States is not about to embark on a 
industrial strength counterinsurgency operation and commit 150,000 troops to some part of the world for a decade, but nor can the United States of America say that our only choice is either that or to do nothing with uh, countries that are suffering problems of internal disorder. So I think there was a hope that some of what we talk about today, not only applicable to Afghanistan, but maybe a lot of what we talk about could be applicable to other future interventions or efforts to improve state building and uh, governance. And, and then with that, I'll transition into some of the discussion that we had this morning. It is interesting, as I was doing a review of what I'll be talking about, the Afghan National Security Forces, as I was going over the literature to see the profound, profound depth of literature on massive failures. And it's as if when we talk about anything that's gone right in Afghanistan, since 2001, and Jim Dobbins did take us through a few of the metrics of success. It's as if that uh, that was just some kind of lucky outcome. It happened in spite of our efforts to achieve failure, where then the volumes written about failure is clearly due to the stupidity of the international community and the Afghans themselves. Uh, and this applies as well, to be fair, in critiques of President Karzai. You look at Jim Dobbins' metrics this morning, and President Karzai presided over the development of a lot of those metrics. Was that in spite of President Karzai? Or is there something deeper here that we need to look into Afghan politics? Um, Dexter Filkins was writing, an, uh, was once being interviewed by NPR, and I have a lot of time for Dexter Filkins, a New York Times correspondent, has reported well on problems in Afghanistan. And not to sound uh, patronizing, but, but uh, Dex, not for Dexter to sound patronizing, he was being pressed after he was talking about all the problems in Afghanistan in spite of all the money that was spent, everything that was going wrong. And so the NPR interviewer challenged Dexter and said, well, look, in fairness, there, there, I guess there has been a lot accomplished that if you're getting to a remote part of Afghanistan, that's like developing, doing development work on the far side of the moon. We can question why people were sent to the far side of the moon to do development work, but when we look at some of the results that have been achieved, we also have to take stock that there have been successes, and I would include among those successes as quickly I'll come on to problems with the Afghan National Security Forces themselves. So five quick thoughts on Afghan National Security Forces. Number one is a need to better understand the political context for efforts to build security forces uh, in post-conflict, or as I think Minister uh, Jalali will soon say, in still conflict societies like Afghanistan. Now, what do I mean about the political context? In terms of doing things not so bad, uh, the development of the Afghan National Army, 2002 to 2003, actually was a politically informed process. And by that, if you look at the DDR, that was going on in 2002, 2003, and 2004, people would say that was generally successful. Remember in 2002, Ismail Khan owned tanks. Fahim Khan and the Panjuris, they owned helicopters. By 2005, those militias had been stood down. Of course, there was still militias existing around the country, but they didn't have tanks. They didn't have frog missiles. They didn't have helicopters. Why was that DDR process successful? Of course, it could not have been successful unless the process to build the Ministry of Defense was also successful. Why on earth would Ismail Khan turn in his weapons if he believed that the Afghan National Army that was being created was going to be turned against him at some point? And so we had, as I said, a very politically informed process we're quite transparent about developing a new Ministry of Defense and General Staff Department, a tiered set of reforms, jobbed a new organizational structure with job descriptions, and three candidates would be nominated for each position. It was very laborious, but it was guaranteed by the United States and the international community. We served as good information brokers. We had credibility at that point. 
We could go on, and perhaps Minister Jalali will want to talk about the Ministry of the Interior. I would say we were not near as successful on efforts at Ministry of Interior reform. It was late in coming, and then it was not as a well-informed political process. I'll conclude on this first point by saying that this is important what I'm talking about right now because I don't think that the United States military is very good at understanding the political context. The military, our military, the United States military, and many NATO countries, NATO partners, they are superb at training infantry battalions. They can do that work. But that's beside the point. That's tactical. The strategic question is the military force, is the police force that's being built, is it politically sustainable within the country that it's being built? Number two is the role of political leaders clearly matter here. You know, when I was in Afghanistan, uh, particularly down day for our Department of Justice team was when they came to me and said they were failing miserably in their mission. We talked at that time about the Attorney General at that time. And I talked to uh, one particularly depressed attorney from the Department of Justice and said, well, attorney, has there ever been a case that you've been on? Because he'd done a lot of international work. Has there ever been a case where it's worked uh, in these really tough conditions? And he said, yeah, it actually worked in Kosovo. And I said, what was the difference? And he said, the attorney general was the difference. The attorney general in Kosovo, at that particular time, he was committed to judicial reform. Now, in the case of uh, President Karzai, President Karzai, in my opinion, he never did embrace the role as commander in chief. I don't know whether he was uncomfortable with it or I think more that he didn't really believe in the model that was being used. It was, in his view, it was an American model. Was it a force that was really reliable? Was it a force that was dedicated first and foremost to Afghanistan? Or was it a force which was being recruited by foreigners and paid wages that were too high? I'm not sure of what his thinking was about the military forces of Afghanistan. I'm not being critical of him. What I will say is that he did not embrace the mission of Commander-in-Chief. And believe me, that profoundly, profoundly matters. That the only way you can get a soul breathed into an army is through the society that that army is to serve. And the Commander-in-Chief going out and rallying the troops, showing his confidence in the force, trying to talk to commanders, and get them on mission. That all matters. I'll tell you here again, our military, we spent 300 times as much effort discussing what type of transport aircraft the new Afghan National Army needed and how many did we need to buy. And we spent very, very little time talking about this fundamental issue of President Karzai as Commander-in-Chief. Uh, President Karzai, uh, to g talk about this uh, soul of the Army, just to stand this on its head now with President Karzai, I remember once in a discussion with the Minister of Defense that the Afghan Minister of Defense talking about why the Afghan Army could not get into Nuristan. And the Afghan Minister of Defense correctly said, how can we get into Nuristan? We don't have helicopters. We can't resupply our troops. We can't do medical evacuation to which President Karzai looked at the Minister of Defense and said, how many helicopters does Taliban have? And that's the point about a soul of the army. Now here, I think he was being a good commander in chief. Third point, dependency and risk taking. That one of the challenges of many that I think we and the Afghans had together as we went into Afghanistan after 9-1-1, we, we didn't know how long our military presence was going to last. We certainly in 2002 didn't anticipate in 2011 that we'd have 130,000 NATO ISAF soldiers on the ground. So at the point that the American military knew that timelines now could be seen on the horizon, that there was the so-called drawdown or an exit strategy or an exit from combat operations, which is being modified as we speak, I think, here in town. Uh, nevertheless, 
there was no real clear incentive or clear vision about how did the transition to Afghan lead have to occur on what kind of timeline. All of that said, though, I would argue that our military and our civilian leadership and the Afghans, we failed collectively to sit down at a reasonable point, 2004, 2005, say, what's our methodology for the Afghans to take lead for combat operations? But here's a problem with that, that if you're in the United States military or you're in the Italian military or in the British military, you're in the Afghan military, you want to win 100 to nothing. You don't want to win 51 to 49. So as we have NATO ISAF forces all over Afghanistan and we're partnering with the Afghan security forces, we want those Afghan security forces, of course, to win 100 to nothing. And I've, if I'm an Afghan platoon leader leading 40 Afghan private soldiers, I want to win 100 to nothing too. But strategically, how do you then balance that against the need to get the Afghans into combat lead. So I used the expression once with President Karzai, as we can now see transition looming large, that perhaps what we're looking for right now is for the Afghan army and Afghan police to be able to go out and get a bloody nose, but we don't want them to get a broken nose. And he said that's about it. That's how I would phrase it. Number four is on sustainability. We talk about sustainability, operational sustainability of forces, fiscal logistics sustainability. People ask the question, well, how is it that here in this year of 2015, we together, we the Afghans, NATO ISAF, we've got ourselves in a position where the Afghan forces that exist right now are going to take anywhere, with the police included, are going to take anywhere from over $4 billion to maybe $6 billion a year just to sustain at current levels. There was an agreement that over the next year or two, we could draw down, the, Af the Afghans could draw down their military and police and numbers, and that would get a sustainment figure of about $4 billion. I don't think that a drawdown of Afghan police and army is wise right now, nor is it on the horizon. But how did we get there that we're in this position of billions and billions of dollars of foreign assistance being needed to sustain the Afghan army and police? Well, actually, going back to assumptions, it's important for this, I think our two days, is keep on asking what were the assumptions of decision makers at particular points in time. The fact is not that year after year, the U.S. Embassy and U.S. military in Afghanistan had a crew of a ship of fools. These were smart people that at each point in time were making decisions based upon assumptions as they saw them. I think it gets back to what Ron Newman was talking about as well. How do you see the world? You make your decisions accordingly. In the case of Afghanistan, believe it or not, in 2002, Minister of Finance Ashraf Ghani and Major General Carl Eikenberry huddled at Ashraf's residence for several nights, and we concluded in the fall of 2002 that an end strength for the Afghan National Army of 70,000 would be proper. 70,000, you know, how could Ashraf and Eikenberry screwed that up so badly? Well, what we saw is Taliban was a spent force. And what else did we talk about at length beyond how do we balance this against the demobilization of the Afghan militias? which was a politically informed task, as I said. What did we talk a lot about? We talked about sustainability in terms of finance. We talked about sustainability in terms of politics of Afghanistan. We talked about sustainability in terms of institutional sustainability of the force. But against all of this, of sustainability, is the question of commitments of aid and assistance two security forces, we can go beyond that, in terms of what does that mean for the prestige of the institution? What does that mean for a signal of commitment? In this case, the United States. What does it mean in case of deterrent? Just a brief uh, vignette from when I was serving with NATO and I went to Albania. I'd been to Afghanistan now for two tours of duty. So we're in the streets of Tirana. 
and we're driving through the streets and my first trip to Albania and I'm turning to an Albanian vice chief of defense who's in the car with me and I said your soldiers have M16 rifles. M16 is a, is a U.S. rifle. So what, why do they have M16 rifles? Because we had been very insistent over years that the Afghans keep the Kalashnikov AK-47 rifle. I said, well, it doesn't make any sense. You know, the, the Kalashnikov's cheaper, it's easier to maintain. Why did you get M16 rifles? And he said, because when our soldiers got the M16 rifle, it was a clear commitment to us that NATO was serious. So we talk about fighter aircraft, we talk about uh, people can be critical and say Afghan army and police, they don't need those kind of bells and whistles, they just need the very basics. But I have to also say, you keep in mind what it means in prestige, commitment, and even deterrence. If you're Pakistan and you're looking at the United States military providing some frontline equipment to Afghanistan, if it can be maintained and if it can be employed, does that have a value that the comptroller who's looking at cost effectiveness and tactics will not come up with an answer that yes, we should still sell this? Third, uh, fifth and final point has to do with uh, the United States military and how we approach these efforts to build security forces, army and police. I'm not going to talk about uh, police because we have Minister uh, Jalali here who I know will say a few words about police. We can talk about that during question and answer. But the United States military, as we go into conflict zones, we tend to bifurcate the operational command, that's the command in the case of Afghanistan that's out there fighting Taliban. We bifurcate that effort with the effort to build security forces. My argument would be that very early on in our stay in Afghanistan, that it should have been clear that the main effort of our military was to help the Afghans stand up a good army and a good police force. We did not deliver in terms of putting the capacity, our capacity on the ground to do that. Within a year, we had no more active duty units that were training the Afghan army. Within a year, we switched to National Guard. National Guard is fine. They are not as good as the active force. Let's be clear on that. And so why did we not use active force? Because they had to go to Iraq, but we never really recovered from that. Secondly, until the peak of the surge, we were manning our embedded uh, advisory teams out in the field, and for the most part, our headquarters in Kabul that was devoted to the training of the Afghan army and the equipping of it, we were manning that at about 50, 60, 70 percent levels. For, so for us, politically, or for our military leaders to say, over the last 12 to 13 years, we have taken serious the effort to build the Afghan National Army, ask them to respond to those statistics that I just gave you. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Orla. I think uh, you made it easier for me because some of the points I wanted to share with you were very eloquently mentioned by General Eikenberry. That's because uh, we worked together for a long time. When I was Minister of Interior for about three years, he worked in a kind of two different roles. First, he was in charge of OMC Alpha, Office of Milit uh, Security Cooperation. And later on, he came as the commander of uh, CFC Alpha, Coalition Forces. And we interacted then. Now, one point that I would like to start with is that was Afghanistan facing a post-conflict situation after the removal of Taliban? The international community did not come to Afghanistan to fix Afghanistan, which was politically fragmented, economically corrupt, uh, bankrupt, socially atomized, in a vortex of regional, uh, uh, surrogate uh, you know, conflict supported by the neighbors. 
It came for different reasons. But in three years, the United States-led coalition achieved the, 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 the objective for what it actually decided to invade Afghanistan. The Al-Qaeda network was disrupted. Taliban were hosting the, the uh, uh, Al-Qaeda network, was removed from power, and the leadership of Al-Qaeda was on the run. So why the United States should stay in Afghanistan? That was the concern was whether they will come back, Afghanistan will again become a source of threat to the United States and allies. In order to prevent that, reconstruction of Afghanistan was an afterthought, not planned before. And I think in all cases in the past, you see that if post-conflict management cannot be planned as an integrated part of the military phase, it will be very difficult to do it after the conflict phase. First of all, the institutional capacity is not there. You cannot mobilize the, 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 the right forces there, the right resources there. And it takes time. And when you wait for long, that vacuum can be filled again by the spoilers. Taliban were removed from power, but not defeated. Their leadership went across the border. If you read General Musharraf's recent interview with Gordon, from day one, they tried to use it as an instrument to influence Afghanistan, uh, to, for having influence in Afghanistan in the post-Taliban period. For whatever reason, for whatever assumption they had, but they were there, so Taliban's were. In fact, the intervention, international intervention, supported one faction, one side of the civil war against the other. The other was not defeated, nor reconciled as part of a peaceful settlement. So they just crossed the border, they came back. Now, the problem was that the false hope that Taliban are spent force, they are gone, and now reconstruct Afghanistan. I mean, that assumption actually caused a high price in, 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 in a years to come. On the other hand, the militias that were taken at allies in order to overthrow the Taliban, they were empowered in Afghanistan. And they actually, the Bonn Agreement legitimized them. Bonn Agreement said that by the establishment of interim administration in Afghanistan, all militias, all mujahideen, all armed groups will come under control of the regime as the army. So it was reintegration. Later on, you have to deintegrate it. So sometimes you call out uh, RDD, reintegration, um, reintegration disarmament, dismantlement, disarmament. It was re, it was actually RDDR. It was reintegrated first. They came and they were, they amounted to, Harl mentioned that uh, in 2002, they were talking about 70,000 army for Afghanistan, but they amounted on the paper 700,000. 11 army corps, 40 divisions, in 80 separate brigades and regiments. And now, with that kind of a situation, you wanted to build the security system in Afghanistan. The, between the 2002 and 2005, there was a, were competing demands. No clear definition of the mission of security forces. What was the mission of security forces? There were competing demands. On the one hand, the about 10 to 12,000 coalition troops who were in Afghanistan fighting terrorism or insurgency, whatever you call them. And then ISAF was peacekeeping, it was only in Kabul. There was strong resistance against expanding them to, uh, to other provinces. Later on, of course, the PRTs just took its place. To, for the expansion. 
And then the, the, the people in, in, in provinces, they suffer from militias, from warlords, mostly. In, in three years, I was in, in Minister of Interior. Most of my time was fighting security threats emanated from these militias, not Taliban. Uh, therefore, the, the building of security forces should be looked at the context of how the Taliban were removed. Later on, as Carl mentioned, with the change of situation, new decisions were made, incrementally. I think in the past 13 years, building Afghanistan uh, institutions was the costliest and longest probably project in history. 60% of $107 billion spent only by the United States was spent on security forces. It's expensive. Could we do it at a, at a lower price? Maybe in the beginning, but it was incremental. In 2004, 2003, the budget of the Ministry of Interior, at that time, Ministry of Interior also controlled all provincial governance, governments, district governments, and municipalities. At that time, the budget of, annual budget of the Ministry of Interior was $127 million a year. Now you go about a few years later, 2010, the budget of training police and army was $1 billion a month, 90% of it paid by the United States. I wish we had a fraction of it in 2002, 2003. The police was the most neglected force. Although in post-Taliban period, the major threat was criminality, drug production, drug trafficking, not much Taliban. In those years, I was able to free 11 foreign nationals who were kidnapped by, by, by terrorists through cooperation from people, with no giving any kind of concession to the, to the kidnappers because people were cooperating. At that time, criminality was the major threat against the population. But police actually was not supported in order to do that. When support came, mostly from the United States, it was because of the upsurge of insurgency and police became militarized and turned into paramilitary forces. And this is the kind of of, of, of problem that started with in Afghanistan. In 2006, all of a sudden, with the upsurge of, of, uh, of uh, insurgency, showed that the neglect in the past five years actually was resulted in this situation. So, in other words, I would say that development of a national security force in Afghanistan should be seen in that context the context of how Afghanistan was invaded, why, and what purpose, and what was the assumptions at the beginning. By 2006, even the assumption was that the threat of Taliban are gone, there's no insurgency. That was, Pentagon even insisted that the number of uh, Afghan National Army, which was set at 70,000, be reduced to 50,000 for two reasons. One was the Taliban risk was now not very serious. Second, Afghanistan cannot sustain even 50,000 troops in Afghanistan. These were the criteria, assumption. But in, 2000, in, the, in London conference, the Afghanistan compact focused more on social and economic development and less on security level because it was assumed that security is fine. In that NATO came to Afghanistan with the same kind of mentality, peacekeeping, where the peace was not there. And then, in the summer of 2006, all the hell broke out. And the upsurge of security in the south and east, from that 2006 to 2008, it became a full-blown war, and, and with 2008, Afghanistan was on the verge of failure. It is after 2008 
or 2009 actually, with a search, counterinsurgency strategy, and a, for the first time that was a clearly defined strategy with sufficient resources were put in place. I'm not talking, I'm not going to talk more about this. I'm going to conclude with two points. First, post-conflict uh, management is important, but first you should know that you have a post-conflict. Some extremists will say that if you cannot manage post-conflict, you should not go to conflict. And that is possible only if post-conflict management becomes part of the original planning for combat. Otherwise, it will be difficult to do it. Second, now, after 13 years, Afghanistan has, a, uh, the uh, National Security Forces of Afghanistan have achieved a lot. They've come a long way, transforming from an odd assortment of militias into a modern, institutions with professional capacity and politically loyalty to a unified government. That's a great achievement. One should not forget that. But the, the, the challenge, as Carl also mentioned, is sustainability. In the history of Afghanistan, you had three times organization of the conflict. One was is 1840 in 41, when the British forces in Afghanistan decided to leave Hawabal, built a kind of a professional uh, army for the Shah Shuja, the, 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 the king who was backed by, 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 by them. And they created Jazail Chis, the, the, the professional the, the infantry units, and others, ignoring the power of tribal militia, tribal leaders. And when the British, uh, you, know, you know, were left, that organization of the army did not help. Then the Soviet Union did that, starting in, eight, in 1986. That created a major, a very formidable army. Army component, police, what they call it, Salandoi, that's a paramilitary force. And then the, the heart or the, the uh, uh, state uh, security uh, units. That actually proved to be a very formal bill, and they defeated Mujahideen in Jalalabad war. But lack of sustainability dissolved that. Now, again, you have a very solid Afghan army, Afghan national police, and state security forces. Until 2017, there's a pledge that they will be funded. What happens after that? Unless there is a kind of a political settlement with Taliban, which will allow the reduction of that force, or some other kind of reason, when that support reduces or dries up, then you have to think what what's going to happen to this army. Sustainability is always a problem after the post-conflict uh, situations, and particularly in Afghanistan. I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you both for two very substantive presentations. Um, I have a couple questions which I'll start off with, and then we'll open it up for the audience. Um, um, I guess the first one, I guess maybe a bit more to you, Carl, is you, your first two points I was interested were not sort of directly on ANA, ANA, ANSF, but highlighting the importance of the politics. And um, you know, I think we were much better at various times at having military strategies or even development strategies, but it was never clear to me exactly what the political strategy was. Um, but also, I, just, I guess my question is, we invested so much more in creating the security institutions of Afghanistan than we have in the civilian institutions. Um, and when we had a president of Afghanistan who did not want to take on the role of commander in chief, 
um, and was actually quite disinterested in his own army, which is quite unusual in that part of the world. Um, but also in part because maybe he didn't, as you mentioned, view it as his own army. And But now as the NATO, or ISAF, US umbrella is being removed and the ANSF become institutions in their own right, and amongst the strongest in the country, do you see a risk of them actually taking on a more political role um, uh, during the coming years? And again, you don't need to look too far in the region to see the impact of very strong security institutions and very weak political institutions. So I guess that's my um, first question. And the second one, I think maybe a bit more to you, um, Minister Jalali, is on the international community was not so interested in the police and, in, and, and came late to the game of investing in the police, but eventually did and invested quite a bit in more recent years. Um, but we always seem to have more of a preference for, in some ways, working with the militias or we didn't want to invest in creating a police force so much as creating quick fixes, um, the Afghan Auxiliary Police or National Auxiliary Police or later on the ALP. And I was wondering if you could comment a little bit about the implications now of some of the legacy of sort of creating these um, militia forces uh, rather than investing in the police. So maybe you first, Carl. Yeah, I'll, uh, just uh, briefly, Andrew, on the, the question of how much more money we put into military operations or just specifically into the Afghan National Security Forces than civilian development. Uh, one of the re obvious reasons is it's just a lot more expensive. Uh, you know, let's compare the Department of Defense budget to the Ministry to the Department of Education budget here in the United States. It's even in Afghanistan, it's expensive. Uh, we can debate um, how different efforts were maybe overly weighted or not weighted enough. I guess on the, the cost is not so much the dollar terms, but the strength of the institution. Well, on the institution itself, I think there's probably two risks that uh, and they, they seem um, opposite possible outcomes, and I think they're, they're there. The first would be on the fragmentation of the uh, Afghan National mm -hmm. Army. Uh, it was interesting as we reached uh, what was starting to become a very evident political crisis in uh, Kabul last fall, there was concern that the Afghan National Army, if they'd have to choose between candidates, might choose a particular candidate. Still today, the high command of the Afghan National Army is uh, more, uh, it has more numbers from the old Northern Alliance and uh, factions related to them than not. Uh, recruiting the Afghan National Army since 2002, 2003 has been all ethnic. It hasn't necessarily been uh, all national, but it's been all ethnic. And I think that the officer corps of the Afghan National Army up to the ranks maybe of major, lieutenant colonel, those who are in their 30s now, in their early 40s, I have confidence that they are developing much more of a national perspective. The Afghan uh, National uh, Army Academy, their West Point, very successful uh, enterprise. And yet we still, I would say, have got a period of maybe 10 more years before the high command of the Afghan National Army, which given you can't create a high command of an army and overnight. So the hand that uh, Afghanistan was dealt in 2002-2003 uh, had a lot of people from the Northern Alliance that uh, had to go into the high command. But still, even that group, they performed well during the election. Uh, there was rumors, but I talked to, uh, at that time, Minister of Defense uh, Bismillah Khan, and at that time, Minister of Interior Dawud Zai, and they both said <clears throat> that the Afghan National Army and the high command of the police did quite well. Still, it's a risk. The second would be, I think, what you were getting at, uh, Andrew. Could the Afghan National Army uh, become a national security state. Uh, they've got uh, a lot of resources. Is there a sense of entitlement that goes with that? Could they become a Pakistan? I, I think that's a possibility if things should start to collapse politically, but I'm not sure that they have the political coherence among themselves that they would necessarily be able to step into that role well, even if, even if many of them uh, wish to and said things are collapsing, so we have to uh, fill the void here. I, I worry more, though, about the potential of corruption within the Army and the police longer term, especially if the economy is going down, because the United States and the, uh, the international community will continue to give money to the Army and police 
and if uh, civilian society is not doing well, that would not bode well. I think, last point, about the advisory mission for the United States and NATO, I think the advisory mission that uh, we're performing right now, much more important than helping the Afghans get better tactically out in the field, although that's important, even more important about than trying to call in air power uh, is the strategic kind of mentoring that we're doing because I still think that we're looked at as probably the best umpires and referees in Afghanistan for the political power brokers and the political leadership when they're wondering what's going on inside of that army and police for the Americans and for NATO ISAF to have a presence uh, in the right positions is useful in that regard. Thanks. As I uh, said earlier, uh, in that stage, initially there were uh, a number of competing demands and contradictions. Uh, police suffered from that too. On the one hand, there was commitment to build democratic institutions, democracy, and on the other hand, to fight insurgency. So the focus on police was instead of building it as an institution to protect the population, it was built to fight insurgency. With pool, uh, while they were poorly trained, poorly funded, poorly equipped, poorly led. <clears throat> they were uh, uh, deployed in small groups in remote areas, only to be a kind of a, you know, uh, something that Winston Churchill once said that like a fat cows asking the, with the wolves to come and devour them. And on the other hand, the mistake that was made in the beginning of the DDR, some people will claim that uh, reintegration DDR was a very successful process. It was successful because I was for, for, for months, I had to go to the north and, and stop fighting between two army corps was supposed to be the army of the state. They were fighting each other while the, the civilian was suffering. So that, when we stopped that, that war between two army corps, we contoned or uh, collected the heavy weapons, as you men uh, mentioned. And yes, heavy weapons were removed, but the, the Police suffered from that because over time, overnight, all militia corps commanders became police chiefs of provinces in order to make it a successful process. And they brought all these cronies, corrupt militias, to the police department of Kandahar, of Herat, Mazar. And that we, we could never, uh, uh, were never able to get out of the negative impact of that decision that was made in 2004. And some of them are still there. Then the, uh, in 2002, when C uh, the, the, I mean, um, uh, security sector reform program was adopted in Geneva, the army was good, it was built from scratch. That was fine. But police, they said, would reform the police. There was no police to reform. They were all militias, faction militias. Uh, they, they had actually manned all the police departments in the provinces. And later on, when I lobbied a lot here in Washington, I lobbied uh, uh, Secretary Rumsfeld twice to help us because Germany does not have the capacity with the lead nation to build the police. And he finally agreed. And then there was a problem between the State Department and Defense Department. We got INL and the State Department is responsible for police. But later on, when would the situation actually make it necessary for to serve police? All support came to, went to police and built it as paramilitary force. That's the story of police. At, as, as, that, it, that's why I think that the most neglected uh, element of security forces was the, the, when you have that kind of a police with $16 salary in the beginning, you cannot expect a very, very clean police. And uh, they, you cannot pay them very well. They will get paid by finding other ways. 